This episode is sponsored by patrons like Kevin Butler and Lana Golikova and Brilliant. It's a skills development website that uses interactive challenges to teach. For example, every research question needs to start with a search, and becoming competent in using online search engines is imperative to that skill. Well, Brilliant has a course specifically for that. Each challenge builds on one another to the point that you will eventually understand the back end of how these systems function. Having just taught a class that spent an entire week on how to do exactly that, I can confirm getting the fundamentals down is absolutely necessary. It allows you to discover what is already done on a given subject, especially the miscellaneous items that may not show up when you simply search. So learning how a thesaurus helps or when to use special parameters can vastly increase your ability to explore a topic. That's where Brilliant can help. They have a bunch of courses meant to develop your problem-solving skills in such topics as math, science, and coding. You'll solve challenges and advance your competence through this interactive format. They tell a story to keep you engaged and powering through the difficult spots. The first 200 to go to the link below, which is brilliant.org slash the cynical historian, will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. And there's many more courses to explore. Anyways, on with the show. Hey, Cypher here. This episode comes by way of a Patreon request. It's the last one I'll be doing, by the way, since I'm retiring that track. Anyways, today we're talking about the 2002 film about Frida Kahlo. She's a fascinating figure, but the movie is kind of meh. A bit meandering and disordered, but it somehow works. Generally, you'll understand the woman herself from this film, though with some serious caveats, but honestly, that's the least interesting thing about her. Let's get through her biography real quick before we get to the more provocative historiography. Her story is full of sex, but her historiography is even more sexy. Stop it. Get some help. Okay, enough of that. Frida Kahlo was born to a mestiza mother and a German father. She survived polio as a kid, and at the age of 18, she was in a trolley car crash that sent a guardrail through her pelvis, crippling her for life. From then on, she suffered from chronic pain and endless physical trauma. Through the weeks stuck in bed, she began painting, using her suffering as a creative catalyst laden with a distinct appreciation for Mexican culture. This Mexicanidad flourished in the 1920s and 30s after the prior decade-long revolution infused a radical spirit in most Mexican artists. The avant-garde was full of communists and anarchists, including Kahlo. She eventually caught the eye of an even more radical painter, Diego Rivera. They were married in 1929, the same year that he divorced his second wife. As you might guess from his multiple wives, this was an open marriage. Both Diego and Frida were very promiscuous, which was an unending source of consternation for the couple. Frida was also bisexual, sleeping with numerous women, some who'd already been with Diego. They even divorced in 1939 at Rivera's request, after Kahlo had left Rivera alone for a year because he'd slept with her sister. but they reunited a year later. Rivera was quite a famous Mexican artist who often painted murals in the United States. They moved to the US for most of the 1930s. Since he was also a communist, this repeatedly landed him in trouble. He even arranged for Leon Trotsky's safety in Mexico, at least until Rivera and Trotsky got into a big argument after two years, possibly because Kahlo had an affair with Trotsky. Because of this acrimony and the fact that Trotsky moved only a little down the road, they were suspected of taking part in his assassination, including Frida spending a couple days in jail. Most famously, Rivera painted the images of Vladimir Lenin into a fresco at Rockefeller Plaza and then refused to remove it, leading to him being fired. He vowed to paint the picture a dozen times in revenge, but only did so once. Diego continued to paint all over the world, but it took a while before Frida saw any success herself. Kahlo's first exhibit came in San Francisco as a combined show of hers and her husband's work in 1931. A year later, the first of three miscarriages sent her into a depressive spiral. 
While she kept painting, she returned to Mexico and wouldn't have another exhibit until 1938. A year after that, she went to Paris and found a lot of success there, even being featured in Vogue magazine. This made many surrealists fond of her work, though she wouldn't accept herself as one of them. Despite having lost some toes due to her worsening condition, she took a teaching position in 1943. She also continued to paint, having only spurts of popularity. Kahlo spent most of 1950 in the hospital, dealing with back issues, and three years later had a leg amputated, binding her to a wheelchair for her remaining five years. She was constantly troubled by medical issues stemming from the trolley crash, and after decades of resolutely fighting them, she finally succumbed to an illness in 1954, possibly by suicide at the age of 47. At the time of her death, she was a revered painter, but her husband was far more of a national symbol. It took decades after her death to become iconic like she is today. Frida Kahlo is perhaps the best known Mexican artist today. When I was asked to do this episode, I instantly went, oh, you mean it's a movie about the unibrow lady? <laughs> She's that iconic. But directly after her death, she faded into relative obscurity. She had some students and acquaintances write about her, but nothing that really sparked posthumous interest. That is, until National Fulment raised her image to popularity in the 1980s. Current Mexican nationalism has a lot of anchors in the United States, mostly through our mistreatment of them. The Chicano movement of the 1960s gained momentum when the U.S. removed our old quota immigration system in favor of a less racist policy. Chicanos fought for equal treatment in the U.S., which affected how Mexicans saw themselves. Students in Mexico saw the Olympics as playing into American hegemony through wasteful spending. They protested the 1968 games in Mexico City. The state massacred them, giving rise to more radical groups such as the National Liberation Forces, which is a predecessor of groups like today's Zapatistas, who are essentially anarchist rebels. Throughout the 1970s, as second-wave feminism swept the U.S. with fervor for the Equal Rights Amendment, Chicanas joined in solidarity. But they also began to show how race was an issue that compounded gender inequalities. Many used art to demonstrate this, and much of it was embraced by Mexicans. Though much of the ideology wasn't really accepted by Mexico, the aesthetic of it and Chicana's opposition to American hegemony was. As they gained popularity, Frida Kahlo became a symbol. In 1982, her art was featured in a traveling exhibit that went through the UK, Sweden, Germany, the US, and finally landed in Mexico. Then a biography of her the following year, by an American, sparked off a craze. Hayden Herrera came from a prominent Vermont family, but clearly struck a chord with our neighbors to the south. Her biography became popular in Mexico, kinda showing the interlinked nature of Mexican nationalism. This popularity ignited what's called Frida mania. Frida became a national symbol. Even today, you'll see her picture all over Mexico and commodified in token trinkets with unibrows. But this began with radicalism, as a kind of symbolic representation of the national trauma of U.S. interference since the revolution. Frida herself was a radical who was part of Mexicanidad and flaunted sexual mores whose career was intricately linked with the U.S. Her popularity today rests on Mexico's surface-level embrace of Chicana feminism, but the symbol has taken on a life of its own. This is how myths are made. They come to define an identity, most often through shaving off the bits that don't conform and imagining new ones. As with Frida's supposed longing to stay in Mexico, and the removal of her actual anti-nationalistic rhetoric. She is a Mexican myth now. In fact, only a year after Herrera's biography, Mexico outlawed exporting Frida's paintings outside the country. She became a symbol that quickly. Of course, Frida mania managed to cross the border, as with so much of this history. It influenced Hollywood, hence why this movie was made. It's based on Herrera's book, and manages to hold true to it, for the most part. <laughs> Generally, this story hits the beats it needs to. There's the stuff about her crash and resulting agony, their numerous sexual affairs, radicalism and Trotsky, and Diego's boisterous career. Honestly, if you want to learn about Frida Kahlo, this will do well for you. Plus, Selma Hayek looks the part, save for certain parts of her that is a bit more amplified than the original. 
I was talking about her prosthetic unibrow, get your mind out of the gutter. <laughs> the film even imparts a greater understanding of her paintings, working many of them into the visual nature of cinema. Some of these can be a bit surreal and come out of nowhere, but generally, they're an interesting way of visualizing it. It's your typical biopic that manages to get the art of the artist correct. But as with basically any biopic like this, they tried to stuff everything in, completely disregarding how to tell a good historical story in the process. That I love. I absolutely love. Um, that's just a movie. I want it. This is your typical Cradle to Grave story, of the type that was oh so common in the early 2000s when it came out. Only recently has Hollywood started coming to terms with the fact that the story structure simply does not work. A few years later, Walk Hard lampooned the entire genre, and we still see the same mistakes repeated over and over again. Hollywood has a lack of imagination when telling biopics, as revealed by shoving every new protagonist into the same shriveled rubric. Frida is no exception. We start with the flashback, show the whimsical childhood, having some inciting incident, see her become overwhelmed with the hectic world she fell into, before reforming her ways just in time to catch up with the flashback. It's so formulaic. But I suppose in 2002, people were not so sick of this formula as we are today. Either way, in shoving Hollow's square peg in a round hole, they had to shave off her quirks that didn't fit the national myth. Throughout the film, Kahlo seems to be just in it for the ride. There's barely even a montage about her radicalism, and it's depicted as her just following Rivera, as though she didn't actually believe any of this stuff herself. At no point does she express any radical politics, and by the time she becomes completely crippled, radical politics are simply out of the picture altogether. This is core to Kahlo's character, and they somehow cut it out. Even when Diego has his run-ins with the Rockefeller Center and Trotsky, Frida seems to be just waiting on the sidelines, maybe having an affair or something, but never actively participating in politics, which is simply false and quite misleading. Then again, that's part of her myth now. It's like a Che Guevara t-shirt, just a surface image while a complete violation of what they stood for. She literally protested American imperialism within the last week of her life. The plot is all kinds of jumbled up, too, which I guess is fine, but can be really confusing. Like, it may seem like too much of a nitpick to point out that Kahlo actually had amputated toes years before it's depicted, and the back problems never stopped, but then you see her climbing the steps in Teotihuacan with Trotsky, and no way was she doing that. This scene is integral to their whole love affair, which the affair probably happened, but it ruins the entire thing when you realize she was already unable to do that kind of running around. The movie also seems to purposefully undermine how much of a cosmopolitan Kahlo actually was. She spent much of the 1930s in the United States, yet the movie shows her pining for her homeland. It's as though Mexicanidad was a nationalist movement, completely removed from its revolutionary roots. So she constantly complains about not having an exhibit in Mexico, and that Americans simply don't get her culture. When it was in the US she saw the most success, and that her politics very much opposed nationalism. Sure, she might have been a Mexican patriot at heart, but she traveled constantly and made a home wherever she went. But that would ruin the climax of the film, when she had her first Mexican exhibition. It's a plot contrivance, but it denies a very fundamental part of her character. Do these things completely ruin the movie? I'll leave that up to you. I think this is simply what we should expect from the myth surrounding Frida. They managed to hit a lot of interesting history about her, but reinforce some harmful misconceptions. All in all, it's a very 2002 rendition of this story. After the period... <laughs> What? <coughs> King. Meow. 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 No. 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 Any success? <laughs> Hi. What do you have against me recording? Hmm? Shoo.